Hello, and welcome to Supplement 5 of Super Deep Movie Analysis. I'm actor and filmmaker Lex Zorn. Well, you know, over the last couple of generations, and especially from the 80s on, there have not been a lot of very popular movies that didn't have at least one sequel, and even a lot of mildly to moderately successful movies have had sequels. Um, one of the very biggest movies that's never had a sequel is Stanley Kubrick's 1980 horror masterpiece The Shining, which is far and away my favorite horror movie of all time, and uh, a movie that if you know me well, you know that I'm quite obsessed with it to the extent of, you know, um, you know wearing this uh, shirt sometimes and uh, enjoying the reaction I get from it. You know, I've gotten um, more reaction to this shirt, both positive and negative, than... Um, any article of clothing that I've ever worn, um, which and and that fact itself says a lot about um, how iconic the movie is, and you know what a masterful job Stanley Kubrick did in creating so many instantly recognizable images, such such as something so simple as two little twin girls. Um, but anyway, um, finally, after 39 years, a sequel is on its way on November 8th. It's titled Dr. Sleep. In fact, um, the, the title is, is interesting for a sequel uh, because, you know, since The Godfather Part Two, back in 1974, 45 years ago, became the first major movie ever with, ever with a sequential title, most sequels then have had sequential titles. Um, so, anyway, um, when I first heard about the movie, I didn't think it was really going to be a sequel to Kubrick's The Shining, um, um, because, of course, I, I heard of Dr. Sleep when, um, well, actually, I heard about it before it came out, um, uh, because I work at a Cracker Barrel old country store, and we um, rent books on audio there, and I saw... Um, a Stephen King book, I don't remember which one, but it mentioned how it contained a preview of um, his next book, Dr. Sleep, the sequel to The Shining. So um, I've been familiar with Dr. Sleep for several years now, and in fact, when I first read the synopsis of it, I was really hoping that my daughter, Aria Kelly, who was doing quite a bit of acting at that time, um, would have a chance to audition for the role of Abra Stone, and then Arya has since moved on to the technical side. She now um, edits all of my films and does a very good job with it. And, you know, I think she's going to be fantastic in that field. But anyway, finally, Dr. Sleep was made. It's about to be released six years after the book and 39 years after the um, Kubrick movie. And... At first, I wondered if the movie was strictly going to be based on the book, which, and I've not read the book, by the way, nor have I read the book The Shining, but I do know that um, Stanley Kubrick changed a lot from um, the book The Shining for, for his movie, and King, um, while he was complimentary of the cinematography of The Shining, he was very critical of a lot of the liberties that Kubrick took in changing the story, such as taking out, or not taking out, but dramatically uh, reducing the emphasis on Jack's alcoholism, and in Kubrick's opinion, uh, excuse me, in King's opinion, though I disagree, by not making it enough of a ghost story um, and turning it into too much of a domestic tragedy. I think it's, I think it's an outstanding ghost story and a domestic tragedy, um, and an outstanding domestic tragedy rolled into one. I think the movie's the complete package. But anyway, uh, King, um, because of that dissatisfaction, in 1997 released his own version of The Shining as a three-part miniseries that originally aired on ABC and is now uh, available on DVD, and which I plan to feature in an upcoming Super Deep Movie Analysis episode, hopefully with my um, collaborator, Robert Landrum, who joined me for the, the episode we did on the Kubrick version of The Shining, as well as on the college basketball drama blue chips. So, anyway, um, um, it was decided eventually that um, um, 
probably for financial reasons because The Shining is so I iconic that Dr. Sleep, the movie, would um, honor both the Kubrick movie as well as King's book. And I just feel like um, it would have gotten, because the Kubrick movie is so iconic, if Dr. Sleep didn't follow that didn't follow the Kubrick movie to at least you know a large extent the audience would be, would be very disappointed and maybe even feel ripped off so um anyway uh you know you can't please everybody but based on the trailer I think a lot of people will be uh pleased with this movie and before I I analyze the trailer uh I'd just like to read the synopsis uh the official synopsis uh, from um, Warner Brothers Pictures, which released the Kubrick um, movie and is now releasing Dr. Sleep. It reads, Still irrevocably scarred by the trauma he endured as a child at the Overlook, Dan Torrance has fought to find some semblance of peace, but that peace is shattered when he encounters Abra, a courageous teenager with her own powerful extrasensory gift known as the Shine. Instinctively recognizing that Dan shares her power, Abra has sought him out, desperate for his help against the merciless Rose the Hat and her followers, the True Knot, not spelled K N O T, who feed off the shine of innocence in their quest for immortality. Forming an unlikely alliance, Dan and Abra engage in a brutal life or death battle with Rose. Abra's innocence and fearless embrace of her shine compelled Dan to call upon his own powers as never before, at once facing his fears and reawakening the ghosts of his past. So, anyway, um, the trailer um, begins. Um, you see a wall, um, and the word hello is written in shock with a smiley face in the O. Then we see Dan... Um, Torrance, Dan Torrance, as he now goes by, played by Evan McGregor, sitting alone looking apprehensive on the edge of a bed in what appears to be a middle-class house with a wooden floor. Then we see Dan walking into a bedroom and seeing the word morning, um, well, morning, that, um, that there's an apostrophe instead of a G at the end, written in shock again with a smiley face in the O. And then we see Dan looking into a room, possibly in a hospice, since it, it is revealed in um, Dr. Sleep that Dan works, works in a hospice, and he looks concerned in this shot. Then we see Dan writing the word school above morning on the wall and drawing a smiley face in the first O in the word school, but not the second O. Um, and I don't know the significance of the smiley face, so anyway, I just thought I'd mention it because, you know, it, it is featured three times. Um... And then we see Dan sleeping and then waking up and falling out of bed amid a loud noise as the wall is seemingly struck from the outside, causing pieces of it to fall out um, inside of Dan's room. He gets up and sees red rum written on the wall through the reflection of the mirror, the way he wrote it on the door in the original. And then we see uh, Dan uh, standing in deep thought as you hear him whisper, just talk to the kid, the kid apparently being Abra. At that, Abra is shown in bed. Abra, played by um, Kylie Curran, by the way. She's shown in bed and suddenly sits up. Then we see a forest along with um, the words based on Stephen King's best-selling novel. Then uh, Dan and Abra are sitting on a park bench, and Abra says, You're magic, like me. And at that, um, a woman is shown from behind sitting on a beach at night in front of a fire. She's wearing street clothes. And then seven people who generally appear to be middle-aged are shown from front view standing behind the fire and in front of an RV. I believe I read on the synopsis of the Dr. Sleep book that the True Knot travels in an RV. And anyway, the, these are apparently members of the True Knot. And then we see Rose the Hat, played by Swedish actress Rebecca Ferguson, looking face to face, but with the faces in the opposite direction, with a young woman who's lying on the ground. And then we see a close-up of that woman's face, looking terrified. She's possibly a True Knot victim. 
um, because according to the synopsis of the book, uh, the true not um, thrive and can continue to live based on the energy that they absorb when they um, torture to death people who have the shining. So yeah, it sounds like this is an even more grim story than, than the original. Um, and amid the, those last four cuts of the trailer, Dan is heard saying, apparently still to Abra, now I need you to listen to me. The world's a hungry place, a dark place. Then we see a girl about 10 years old in a forest near a lake, and Rose warmly says to her, hi there. Then we see uh, several apparent members of the true knot in a forest. We hear Dan saying again, uh, apparently to Abra, I only met two or three people like us. Then Rose is holding tightly onto the wrist of the girl. Dan says they died, and then the apparent true knot members suddenly swarm to the girl. Then we see uh, Danny riding his tricycle in the Overlook Hotel and looking over to room 237, which opens by itself while we hear the adult Danny continue. Um, when I was a kid, I bumped into these things. We then see the inside of the room, including the bathtub, and then the curtain opens, revealing a woman. Uh, we then see Dan and Abra talking on the park bench again, and Dan says, I don't know about magic. I, and then he stops and pauses, then continues, I always called it the Shining, and then we see the blood coming out of the elevators at the Overlook. Then um, church-type pipe organ music starts playing, and we see a black screen reading this November. Um, and as the music continues, we see a female from back view, and it appears to be a child being pushed in a shopping cart in a grocery store. Then we see a van parked on a road in a rural area with some kind of crop growing on each side. And a young boy in a baseball uniform starts to enter the passenger side. We then see Abra lying down in the backseat of a car at night while she and Dan put their palms together. And then we see an extremely short cut of Danny running through the Overlook Hotel. And then we see a pair of gloved hands trying to dig dirt off of something. And then a close-up of a young adult female who appears to be seriously ill, and then a close-up of Dan's face looking very concerned. And then we see a shot of a theater whose name is simply Theater, which is odd, I've never seen that before. And the marquee reads, now showing um, Casablanca. And we see a young adult female is walking away from the theater and is now about 50 feet away from the entrance, while a bearded adult male whose age range is hard to pick out is walking about 20 feet behind her. And then we see Abra standing while a female hand touches the back of her head. And then we see an extremely quick shot of the Grady twins. Um, possibly it's extremely quick because it's clearly not an image from the original movie. And then we go to a black screen that simply means that, that, that simply says the world. And then we see a woman wearing a mini skirt walking while holding a hypodermic needle with both hands behind her back, and then we see Abra touching a black man who looks like he's in his 30s on the right side of his head while he shakes, and then we see a black screen will shine again. So the full message, this November, the world will shine again. And then we see Rose wearing a black hat screaming while she's on her knees in a forest at night and dozens of lights are seen in the background. And then we see someone whose identity I'm not sure of appearing to have an awful nightmare. Then Dan, then Dan is shown sitting cross-legged in his room. Suddenly, the room tilts and he slides toward the wall, which now reads murder. The screen goes blank and the music stops as he hits the wall. Now Dan is shown as an adult in the caretaker's apartment of the, over, of the Overlook Hotel. It looks like it's been rotting for decades and he now sees... He now looks through the door that his father axed with the word red rum still written underneath the hole, underneath the, the um, axed hole in red lipstick. And finally, Dan puts his face up to the hole and looks through as his father did in the original. And then with a, with a black, and then amid a black screen, Symphony Fantastique, the opening theme of the original, uh, written by French composer Hector Berlioz, plays as letters appear on the screen seemingly randomly until they spell Dr. Sleep, and then uh, 
those words are replaced by November 8, and then finally the trailer ends with the credits. So, um, the, um, the trailer doesn't really give a whole lot of insight into what the film is about. Um, you know, I, it looks intriguing, and obviously because it's a sequel to The Shining, I would go see it no matter what. But um, when I compare the trailer with the synopsis, or the synopses that I've read, um, both on the back of the audiobook of Dr. Sleep and then other places online, I'm able to piece it together. I, I think pretty well to give me a good idea of what this film is about. And, you know, um, originally the, the Shining, the Kubrick version, it was a very good box office hit, but it wasn't an enormous box office hit. The, but the film did become a super iconic classic over the decades and is now one of the most popular movies of all time. And so it was natural that there likely would be a sequel at some point. And I think this is probably a good way to do it. I think doing another sequel about another family staying at a haunted hotel um, probably would would not have worked well. It, have, it would have probably been no better than a second, or really probably no better than a third-rate version of the original. Um, but, you know, last year we saw in the movie Creed 2, uh, a continuation of the Rocky series, that it can really work well to bring back a character after decades as, you know, um, Ivan Drago, played by Swedish actor Dolph Lundgren, returned to the role 33 years later. Now, this movie, you know, um, Dr. Sleep doesn't feature any original actors, but it does bring the character of Danny Torrance, now Dan Torrance, back after 39 years. And certainly, that can be... There, there's a lot of potential to explore what happens to a kid who endured that trauma at that age. And I know that the book claimed that Dan had uh, repeated his father's legacy of anger and alcoholism. Now, alcoholism is something that Stephen King has suffered from in real life, suffered from it for many years. I think he's been sober for, I think, I think since 1990, so that would be 29 years now. Um, and, I, yeah, and, and you know, um, one of the big changes that Kubrick made from the original was he de-emphasized, one of the big changes that Kubrick made from the book is de-emphasizing alcoholism. Um, however, um, Kubrick didn't um, totally take alcoholism out of the story. Um, you know, um, Wendy does mention that Jack... Um, Wendy does mention that a Jack um, dislocated um, Danny's shoulder while drunk, and then Jack and 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 Wendy added that Jack stopped drinking alcohol then and hadn't consumed any in five months. And then Jack tells Lloyd um, as Jack is about to take his first drink at at the. In, in the gold room in the Overlook Hotel, here's to five here's to five miserable months on the wagon, and all the irreparable harm it's caused me. So, yeah, the alcoholism is acknowledged enough in the Kubrick movie that if Doctor Sleep places a lot of emphasis on it, uh, and Danny repeating his father's legacy of alcoholism, it won't seem like a big stretch. I don't think. Um, diehard fans of the original would, you know, have any problem with that continuity-wise. Um, one thing that I think will have to be changed since it was decided to make this, you know, um, and bill it as a sequel to the, uh, to, to the Kubrick movie, in the book, uh, Danny does uh, research to try to find um, Dick Halloran and finds out that he died in 1999. Now, keep in mind that in both the book and in the miniseries Halloran survives. Jack's weapon of choice in both the book and the miniseries was not an axe but a croquet mallet. He struck Halloran but Halloran survived and in, in fact is even seen alive in the last um, in the in the last scene of the miniseries which takes place at Danny's high school graduation about 10 years after the events at the Overlook. So 
um, basically, you know, if this Dr. Sleep movie claims that Halloran died in 1999, then, <laughs> you know, that that is going to be a major continuity error because, you know, obviously any diehard fan would remember Halloran's death very well. I Certainly, I could never forget it. I'll never forget how I jumped there uh, the night before Halloween in 1981. Uh, when I saw the movie for the first time. One of the great scares in Hollywood history, you know, right there. So, um, I think that would probably need to be changed, th that aspect um, of, of the film. Um, although, um, in in the IMDb credits, um, the, uh, both... Halloran and Wendy are mentioned as characters, and it should be noted, by the way, in the book Dr. Sleep, Wendy is said to have died in 1999 from lung cancer, possibly stemming uh, from um, damage sustained, you know, when the Overlook Hotel blew up. And, of course, that's something that would have to be changed for the movie as well. In, in the book and the miniseries, um, the Overlook exploded, obviously, in the Kubrick movie. Well, obviously, if you've seen the movie, you, you know it, it, it didn't blow up. It did not blow up, so it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But that's something that would have to be changed if they're going to stay in accordance with the book. But I do know that in Doctor Sleep, um, there are some um, flashback scenes in which um, uh, Danny and um, Mr. Halloran are featured from you know um, Danny's childhood, you know, in the time shortly after. Um, after that they left the hotel so you know we'll see what happens there so obviously there would need to be some changes uh, made to keep it in line with the um, to, to keep Kubrick fans from being disappointed but it, it does seem like they're also going to try to satisfy the King fans uh, of the book as well so it'll be an interesting balancing act you know um, translating something from one medium to another is an inexact science to say the least and transferring a, a book to a film is, is a great example of that and there have been plenty of uh you know uh, attempts to do that which failed miserably and then you know there have been others that, that, that worked but um you know like the original while i've not read the um the book the shining i know that um Kubrick made a lot of changes, but I think for what he wanted to do with the movie, I think the changes, you know, worked very well. Like, for example, uh, in the book, and this is explored in the miniseries as well, um, Jack is, um, Jack has a resentment with, J Jack resents, you know, um, authority figures because of his tyrannical father. And um, because of that, you know, um, Ullman, the hotel ma man, the hotel manager, is portrayed as a total jerk in in the book and the miniseries. So instantly, Jack is uncomfortable with with the job. Whereas, you know, as Kubrick took away most of the backstory of Jack, then you know it wasn't necessary to make Ullman a bad guy. In fact, Ullman is uh, as played by Barry Nelson in the movie is portrayed as a nice guy, whereas, you know, portrayed by Elliot Gould in the miniseries is portrayed as, as a real jerk, um, very controlling, um, and and treating Jack with a very condescending attitude. So, um, uh, anyway, um, also from what I read about the climax of um, the book Dr. Sleep, um, without giving away the ending, you know, um, for those of you who, um, aren't aware of what it is, and of course, you know, the movie, the, the ending could be quite a bit different for, for the movie, could be completely different, we'll see, um, it was obviously very different between, uh, King's book and Kubrick's movie, but it's, um, if the ending in the, in the Dr. Sleep movie is like it was in the book, um, in regard to the character of Jack, I think that would be very hard to, hard for fans of the Kubrick movie to accept because Jack 
you know, basically, if you've only seen the Kubrick movie, you just know Jack as a guy, maybe he was just kind of weird in the beginning, but not really a bad guy, but then became a bad guy. Whereas, you know, Jack, as written by Stephen King and portrayed in the book and the miniseries, um, was basically a nice guy, but who had this problem with alcoholism and uh, anger. And, you know, even when Jack does go crazy in the miniseries, and I guess in the book also, and tries to kill his family, it's still made clear that Jack is not evil. He's just under the control of these uh, evil spirits. Whereas there is no such uh, message sent in the Kubrick movie. Um, you know, the end of the... Um, I mean, the, the end of the miniseries, which I saw, you know, it, it could have never worked as the end of the... Um, the end of the Kubrick movie because Jack is portrayed so as being so fundamentally different bet between the two versions. So, um, you know, um, and, and I, th I think Kubrick obviously was one of the great filmmakers of all time. Um, and King was, um, is obviously a, a great writer and they obviously had very different visions for the same story. You know, the, the movie, the documentary movie, The Shining Code 2.0, really hit the nail on the head, saying that in the Kubrick movie, most of the plot of the book is there, but the message and emphasis is far different. Um, and once I heard that, it's like, yeah, they got it. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. And um, one other, at least one other thing I, I want to mention before I sign off, I, might, I, could think, I could think of others before I sign off too, uh, given my passion for this topic, but I know that, um, I don't, what was I going to say? Um, oh yeah. One thing, one, one reason I think, in fact, I'm almost certain why Kubrick's movie has become so iconic is because there are so many instantly memorable images and lines of dialogue. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if Dr. Sleep um, does anything like that. And similarly, I think that's one reason why the original Psycho, you know, is so iconic as well, for, for, the, for I think, for largely the same reasons. And, you know, to some extent, although not to the extent of this one, you know, it was 23, well, it was, it was a long time before we got a, seek, a sequel to Psycho. Um, although, granted, when the original Psycho came out, sequels were far less common than they would become in the 70s and especially the 80s and beyond. Uh, it was 23 years before we finally got a sequel to Psycho. And while um, I like two of the three Psycho sequels, I like Psycho 2 and then I like Psycho 4, the beginning, which is actually both a prequel and a sequel. I don't care a lot for Psycho 3 uh, because it if Psycho 3 apparently didn't realize that Psycho was not a slasher movie, and unfortunately they they tried to make Psycho 3 almost as if it were, you know, in, in the... I mean, it's it's better than the... It's much better than the average slasher movie, but certainly, you know, um, I, I think it really let down the series, which I felt largely redeemed, it, redeemed itself with Psycho 4 The Beginning, which is the last Anthony Perkins movie it was made probably intentionally to close the door on Norman Bates as Perkins was dying from AIDS at the time. He only lived a couple of years after the movie came out. Um, but, you know, to me, the thing about the, the Psycho sequels, what, were they, um, where they missed the mark from the original to the greatest extent is what, well, I, I do, I think there, there's a lot uh, that I like about, like I said, two and four, and you, even there are some things I like about three, but where all of those movies fall far short of the original is that they're very conventionally made by comparison. They could have been made by any average director, whereas, you know, Psycho, uh, the original, is just such an incredibly unique looking film, as is Kubrick's The Shining. And, you know, the um, I, I like the miniseries probably better than the bulk of fans of the Kubrick movie do. I mean, to me, the, Sh the Kubrick Shining is a perfect 4 out of 4. I'd still give the 1997 miniseries written by King and directed by Mick Garris 
three and a half out of four. I think it's very good. But one area in which it falls short is that there are no iconic images. The camera work, it, it just looks like any other, you know, TV movie of the day. The the look of, of, of the miniseries is just very ordinary. It's, it's, it's professional, but it's just nothing that stands out from the pack. And then, you know, there are no iconic lines a, at all. And then, you know, uh, of course, you know, once... Kubrick upped the weapon from a croquet mallet to the axe. Growing back to the co croquet, growing back to the croquet mallet just wasn't as scary. Although you know, I still recommend the um, the, the miniseries pretty highly. And you just, it, it's just very important to view the miniseries as it is on its own merit, rather than you know how similar it is or isn't. And it's not very similar to the uh, Kubrick movie. So um, I'll be really curious as to how um, a as to how um, this movie um, looks. If if there are any images that become iconic, any lines that become iconic, we'll see. And even without iconic images and lines, it can still be a great movie. But you know, and, and you know, the the thing is, you can't just set out to make a movie a classic and do it, you know, you can have the best plan in the world and the movie doesn't end up becoming a classic. You know, making a movie a classic is the product of so many things that just happen to work out, you know, t together. Um, so, you know, maybe this will work out, you know, well, maybe it won't. You know, to me, if it's at least a three and a half star out of four movie, I'll, I'll think they did a darn great job, you know, following up the original and so, anyway, um, I'm glad that the sequel is finally made. I think certainly um, ex re-exploring one of the most intriguing child characters of all time, Danny Torrance, showing him 39 years later how he responded to that and how he's responded to you know having that psychic gift of The Shining all these years. Um, it's got a lot of potential, and then, um, and then seeing you know. Um, how he forewarns, you know, um, the young generation. You know, um, Evan McGregor, who plays uh, Dan Torrance in this one, um, I don't think I've ever... I'm looking at his uh, IMDb profile right now. I don't think I've ever seen anything he was in. He voiced he voiced Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star, Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. And the, the, yes, that's true. I've never seen that movie. Um, but anyway, he, he's uh, my age. We're both 48. I was born December 14th, 1970. He was born March 31st, 1971. And by the way, it should be noted, he's from Perth, Perthshire, Scotland, United Kingdom. Um, yet, you know, he's speaking in a um, perfectly... Um, sp speaks in uh, Dr. Sleep, at least in the trailer, in a perfect American accent. And being an actor myself, I am absolutely fascinated and awestruck by people who um by people who um you know um are good at um foreign accents it's something i have very little experience at i'd like to do a lot more in the future my brother robert McAtee actually developed a, a russian accent several years ago for a film he was acting in he did it for me over the phone sound you know maybe a russian would disagree although to me it sounded authentic um but it's something I would like to try more of in the future. I've been acting 10 years now, and I'm always looking for ways to expand and branch out on. I think accents would be another thing. And then another, other uh, than Rebecca Ferguson, um, who's from Sweden, she speaks with a perfect American accent in this in this film too. So that that's very impressive as well. So a um, couple, uh, a lot of international star power in in this movie. Um, so. Looking forward to it. Already counting down the days to November eighth. It's uh, let's see. Let me figure out here. I, there's actually a program you can uh, a, a web page on the internet where you can actually look up stuff like that. How many days it you know it is to or from a certain day. Let's see number of of days until November eighth, and the answer is one hundred and forty one. Okay, so that's twenty weeks from tomorrow. And by the way, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, I'm a high school 
football commentator, and um, I will most likely have a playoff game to commentate that night. So um, last year, I actually, um, well, Bohemian Rhapsody uh, came out on November 2nd, which is a Friday, and I'm a diehard fan of the rock group Queen, and I went out, to, I went to see that on the day of its release, and then um, went to the game I broadcast that night. I saw uh, like a 1230 in the afternoon showing, so I'd probably do that for Dr. Sleep as well. So anyway, um, you know, like I said, I, I, I don't expect that this is going to be as good as the original because, I mean, what is? I mean, you know, uh, I just want to see a great effort, something that really shows a good development of the character of Danny and hopefully has some positive messages of hope. And, you know, I just want something that's going to honor the legacy of the original i i hate it when a sequel completely misses the mark there are a lot of examples like a couple like one of my favorite movies of all time is the bad news bears the 1976 original and i think what the two sequels and the remake all failed i think where they all failed um even though i sort of like the new remake uh the, the 2005 remake i think it pales in comparison to the original I think the uh, first sequel, the Bad News Bears and Breaking Training, the Bad News Bears and Breaking Training was okay. Then the Bad News Bears go to Japan. The the second sequel, I, I think, is one of the, really one of the worst um, major studio movies of all time. Um, I'm not exaggerating. Um, especially the last two thirds of it are downright awful. And I think, and the reason that those sequels just didn't work out very well is because. Uh, well, the, the 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 2005 remake works well as a comedy, but there's no social commentary, no message in it. The, the sequels all failed to understand what made the original great. I think that's true with the Death Wish series as well. The first Death Wish, I think, if you saw the four Death Wish the four Death Wish sequels, and then went back and watched the original, you'd be shocked at how different it is. The four sequels just completely lost sight of why the original was great, um, and. So hopefully that hopefully none none of the um, to to me I'll be happy if Doctor Sleep does not make any of the mistakes that sequels typically make, namely especially forgetting why the original was or not realizing why the original was great, and I also hope they don't turn it into a gore fest, you know, um, because the original well The Shining does have. Obviously, the blood coming out of the elevator is one of the most iconic, disturbing images in movie history. Um, and then, you know, the girls who had been killed in, in the hallway. There there are some moments of blood and gore, but, I mean, far less than the average slasher film. Far less. The movie is just psychologically terrifying. And I hope that um, Dr. Sleep uh, terrifies people in that way rather than relying on gore. I, I just think it's not so much that Gord nauseates me. To some extent it does, but I mean, it takes a lot to really disturb me, but I just think that gore becomes such a crutch in horror movies sometimes, and ever since the gore fest started in the early 80s, when that became the horror movie trend, movies largely have forgotten how to scare you, and instead just try to nauseate you, you know. And so... Hopefully, Dr. Sleep will avoid all, all the uh, traps that sequels fall into and that modern horror movies tend to fall into. Hopefully, it'll be a really classy movie, you know, um, and the, 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 there will be, you know, some positive messages of, of hope in there as Danny, because um, I, I know that he does give Abra some, in, in the book, give Abra some, you know, encouraging words about, you know, how to live her life in the future. And, you know, Evan and I being the same age, you know, both being 48, I've reached the point in my life the last few years that I feel a lot more comfortable just, you know, giving advice to um to to young people based on my life experiences, you know, hoping that they won't repeat the mistakes that I and, you know, other people have made. And so I and it should be noted that there are a lot of horror movies that do really have messages. And even the Kubrick movie, while I don't think there's any attempt to gr- give any great moral story, I think there is a message in there that Jack was mentally a weak person, that he was easy to manipulate and, you know, let these ghosts come between 
him and his family. And by the way, one thing that I forgot to um, mention is that at least in the book, Abra Stone is Danny's um, half niece, uh, half niece. It turns out that Jack fathered an illegitimate child with a woman, and then the, uh, father, and that child was a girl, and then had uh, Abra. Um, however, I'm not sure if that's going to be the case in the mo- in the movie because uh, Kylie Curran, who plays Abra, um, she looks like she's part black, and maybe they're going to say that you know. Um, that you know, Danny's half sister, you know, married a black, a black man. What that could be, and that's more common these days. I mean, you know, my children's mother is of, of um, Asian Indian descent, so you know that that could be the case. But I'm just because there's nothing in the materials that describes Abra as being of relation to Danny. You know, um, I don't know. Although uh, there is evidence that. The Shining is hereditary, as Dick Halloran says in the original, that he and his grandmother shared it. So, um, certainly it would make more sense for Abra to have it if she is, in fact, a relative of Danny's. So, we'll see, you know, um, so we'll, we'll find out a lot of things in 141 days, and then at some point after that I will be back to super deep analyze the movie. And as I've spent uh, 41 minutes and 21 seconds now super deep analyzing a two minute and 40 second trailer, I can only imagine, you know, for a two hour movie or whatever it is, you know, how long I'll spend on that. Hopefully I'll get um, Robert Landrum to join me for that episode as well, but, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can ar- arrange that. But um, anyway, I look forward to bringing you that episode and, um, you know, see the last, uh, see the last few episodes I've done. Let me think here. Uh, Last one was the uh, independent filmmaking um, episode with Michelle Gusso. Then before that, it was the Creed 2 trailers. Still need to do an episode on Creed 2 itself. So, um, yeah, the, it, it's been since Blue Chips uh, last July when I actually super deep analyzed an entire movie, but I promise I'll be back to do that soon. I have several lined up. I just need to find the time to do it. And some of them will be solo, some with... Um, um, with guest co-hosts, um, including Robert and Michelle. Um, so anyway, um, I think, uh, this is everything for now. Um, so, uh, if I think of anything else, who knows, maybe I'll do a, uh, uh, another episode or maybe there'll be another trailer episode. Maybe there'll be another trailer, um, issued. And if so, I'll do an episode on, or a supplement on that as well. So anyway, um, Again, really excited. You know, I'll be there probably opening day. Um, and uh, most likely at that theater there in Avon, Indiana, um, since that's the closest theater to the two uh, teams, Avon and Plainfield, that I will be uh, commentating this season. And Avon is much more likely to be still uh, playing on November 8th. They're going to be a state championship contending team this year. So, anyway... Uh, all right. I uh, can't think of anything else. Uh, so um, I will uh, uh, wrap this up here. Um, this concludes Supplement 5. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I cordially invite you to join me again in the near future for another episode or supplement. And as always, feel free to share this video and to like super deep movie analysis on Facebook and to leave comments, send me email, add me on Facebook, whatever. I'm an easy guy to reach. And I always love to correspond with people who love these uh, movies as much as I do. So, um, until we meet again for super deep movie analysis, this is Lex Zorn reminding you there is a difference. Only you can make.